This podcast is part two of two on neurocognitive enhancement and continues the conversation with Dr. Giordano from where it left off in part one. Now, one piece that I want to make sure that we get to, because you, of course, are the current chair of the neuroethics program of the IEEE Brain Project, and you've touched on this a few times so far, what kinds of ethical hurdles does the DoD face in developing neuroenhancement technologies? I, I think there are several, and, and I, I really do want to give a shout out to the IEEE Neuroethics and Brain Projects. Um, I have the opportunity to work with some very, very intelligent and, and talented people, both in our core group, which is an assemblage of subject matter experts in bioengineering, neurotechnology, neuroscience, as well as philosophy, ethics, and law, as well as now what we call our ancillary group. And we sort of made a solicitation to individuals in the field who may want to be participatory in actually developing this matrix into its fullest extent at the intersection of various categorical technologies technologies and the ethical, legal, and social implications that they may generate spawn or that arise from their use. So once again, I'm, 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 very, I'm very honored and in many ways humbled by, by the, the talent that has been accumulated in, the, in that working group, and I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of that. The particular working group that, that I'm steering over and above the overall project is that that deals with the, the use of neuroscience and technology, particularly neuroengineering developments for military intelligence applications. And I think here, this, this touches back on some of the, what we call NELSI, neuroethical, legal, and social implications that we addressed previously. Namely, that within the military, at least within the military in an open society as we have here, we're making fair allowance for the idea of informed consent, respect for individual autonomy. And while we're seeking to do this in those ways that are generally collective to the military ethos, for conservation of force capability, augmentation of force capability, and economy of force. In other words, make it a, a more capable fighting force, if you will. We're also certainly acknowledging the autonomy and respecting the autonomy of the individual. Consent, capability, continuity of research and care, all of these are the contingencies are necessary for that individual's consent being valid and having probity. But I think one of the things we're, we're also exploring is, well, what, what is that the mission then that we're seeking to do? Are we making super soldiers, so to speak? And of course, in an open society as we have here in the United States, there is some level of transparency between the mission and activities of the military and intelligence community and the polis. Now, of course, that's not absolute because certain things must be classified in virtue of national security. But at very, very least, the intent and purpose, if not the method, needs to be communicated. And in some cases, these things are, as we said, provocative, if not contentious. So entertaining that dialogue in such a way that maintains transparency and also in such a way that gains what I'll call general public approval or at least awareness of the necessity to do certain things has been a strong dictate in the issues and implications that we need to confront and need to address and in some cases resolve. But the other issue really is the global effect. Please understand that neurosciences are no longer just the, the purview of the United States and Western Europe. Not at all. I mean, we're seeing that there's a real uptick, if you will, a verticalization in the performance and capability trajectory curve of brain sciences and neuroengineering in places like China, Korea, and elsewhere throughout the world. And certainly we understand that not only those places that are large developed countries that are pushing forward these agendas, but also interaction with lesser developed areas of neuroscience and technology that are playing both catch up and maybe catching the benefit of some of these countries interaction by virtue of as proxy or direct investments. So what we're seeing is that brain science is being leveraged upon the global stage. And the issue there is, of course, that not all cultures are identical. Not all cultures have identical histories needs, values, philosophies, and ethics. And it becomes important to understand those variations, differences, as well as the similarities in philosophies and ethics that may be contributory to the different parameters, paradigms of research programs that may be entertained in other countries. And understanding what that could then mean or portend for the use of neuroscience and technology in applications such as national security, intelligence, and defense. Getting back into that kind of competitive um, side of this, the report mentions, and again, you mentioned this just a little bit, the report mentions that China in particular is outpacing the US in neuroscience, R&D, 
But overall, there doesn't seem to be a good understanding of what neurocognitive warfighter capabilities other nations either have or are currently developing. How important is that to the direction of our own research? Um, I think that the, and what I'll call an open source understanding of what's being done may be somewhat ambiguous or in some cases fuzzy, but I think that the idea of deep surveillance, inclusive of surveillance of tacit effects and capabilities, has provided a somewhat clearer picture, again, not, not crystal and clear, but a somewhat clearer picture of not only the current capabilities, but the capabilities to then advance the sciences in particular ways that may be somewhat more developed and somewhat more close to being applied in operational practices than we may have here in the United States. So an understanding of what those global capabilities are and how they will evolve, I think becomes an important point, not only for the report that we did, Cyborg Soldier, which was certainly looking 30 years into the future, but I think also for an understanding of what represents clear and present progress in these areas elsewhere and what that portends for the necessary of the necessity of at least preparedness on our part, if not trying to remain apace and do so in a way that maintains the moral high ground. So there seems to be, from what you're saying, this tension between developing these neurocognitive enhancement capabilities quickly. We want to gain an edge over adversaries while simultaneously moving cautiously to mitigate some of the ethical, safety, privacy concerns that we've talked about. Would you offer your thoughts on that, share your ideas regarding how DOD should be navigating R&D in this space? Uh, I'm not going to tell the DOD what they should do, but I can certainly make some suggestions as to what might be possible so as to be able to essentially handle or file down, if you will, these two very sharp horns of the dilemma. And let me let me explain both horns, if, if I may. One is, as you say, that, that neuroscience and neurotechnology are a global enterprise. And like any science and technology, its potential value and its actual viability for use in national security, intelligence, and defense agenda and operations, I think is being ever more recognized and realized. So the one horn represents the facility, the validity, and the value of key areas of neuroscience and technology in these types of operations. If for nothing else, mind you, to be able to understand what are the neurocognitive elements by which individuals become vulnerabilized and volatile to violence. If I were king of the world for a day, and trust me, I'm not even crown prince, but if I were king of the world for a day and someone said to me, what should we use neuroscience and technology for? The answer would be simple. Peace. End of story. Close the book. We should be able to utilize neuroscience and technology in ways that allow us to have a deeper understanding of human commonality and human differences on our neurocognitive emotional behavioral levels that can then be used to leverage our understanding and cooperation with each other in those ways that essentially avoids escalation to violence. In other words, it should be contra bellum. That's what it should be. And the optimistic side of me prays for that, hopes for that. The pragmatic side of me recognizes that historically science and technology very often is uptaken by individuals, groups of individuals, nation states to be able to leverage power. And leveraging power is not just a question of knowing what your potential competitor and or adversary is doing, thinking and the way they might behave predictively, but also influencing them in those ways that go from the sublime all the way to the severe. And certainly the brain sciences, because of their capability to assess and affect cognition, emotion, and behavior, exercise tremendous power when capabilized in those ways. That said, the other horn of that dilemma is that how do we, whoever we may be, for example, for this conversation, those of us in the United States and with our international allies, seek to engage programs of development, research, testing, evaluation, perhaps use in operational practice of the neurosciences and technologies in those ways that allow us to at least remain prepared for not only the eventuality, but the actuality and reality that these programs, developments, techniques, and technologies are being developed for these, these purposes elsewhere, but also to remain apace and, and arguably, and I think defensibly, if not remaining apace at very, very least in an economic sense, so as to be able to create stability, in other words, balanced hegemonies across the economic stage, 
certainly to at least recognize where advantages and disadvantages lie in those domains of these uses that may be relevant to public safety, public health, and security. In other words, what if these things were weaponized, either kinetically or non-kinetically, would we be prepared for that? Do we understand what that would be and how might we, at very, very least, mitigate, if not counter that? But in so doing, what we see is when those two horns are presented, this represents a true dilemma. Knowing what's going on internationally, striving to be able to remain a pace prepared and if not ahead of that, and at the same time, understanding that such progress ahead and developments are certainly going to incur a whole host of neuroethical, legal, and social implications and issues, not only nationally and domestically, but internationally as well. So how do you sort of, quote, fight for right and honor or fight for right and freedom and keep your honor clean, so to speak? It ain't easy. Um, I, I think that there are a number of ways that it can be done, but describing those ways and articulating those ways are two different things. You know, it's very easy to say, how do you become a millionaire? Well, make a million bucks. Well, how do I make a million bucks? Well, roll up your sleeves. It's going to take a while. Same thing here. I think what's very important is uh, addressing a risk assessment and mitigation approach. We've talked about the idea of developing that, and my group has done some work both with DARPA and with the AMA to develop what that framework would look like. And again, a, a deep, deep bow of homage to my colleague, Dr. Bill Casebeer, formerly at DARPA and formerly at Lockheed Martin, who really took the initiative steps in these areas to define what certain contingencies and responsibilities were. And Bill and I worked together to expand this into a more usable and, and, and viable framework that was more applicable across a range of different operational situations. So what we've called for is asking key questions, what we call the six W's. What are the actual capabilities of the science and technology? Why are they being considered for use? Who will receive these uh, benefits, burdens, or in some cases, weaponized approaches? When will they be used? Which mechanisms are in place to contain them if, in fact, these things then get runaway effects or to provide the necessary substantiations? And so these questions, I think, provide parameters by which we then ask key questions, not only of the technology, but of ourselves. It is techne logos, literally. Techne meaning tools, logos, or rational accounting. It's up to us to take a rational accounting of not just the tools that we have at hand, the technology, but a rational accounting of the context, the purposes, the intent, and perhaps the consequences, both proximate as well as potentially distal, that may be evoked by using these things in a variety of ways and modeling them out. And then it's also important to frame these things in their context of use. What are those consequences in various contexts and circumstances? What is the character of the use? Is it for research? Is it for optimization? Is it for weaponization? Is it for changing the behavior of others? What, what key elements will be there to make sure there is continuity of clinical care and research, both for our own and perhaps for the world at large? And ultimately, there are also going to be cultural issues that need to be appropriated when dealing with how we develop international law and ethics to guide research development and potential use. But that just sort of gets you to the point of being on the end of the diving board, if you will. Once you then dive off that board and answer that question, you still have to appropriate what ethical system do we use to navigate this terrain? And there are many. More than that, we have to ask, well, what are the potential benefits of utilizing neuroscience and technologies versus the burdens and the risks? Working with a former student of mine, Rhiannon Bauer, we tried to explore those parameters and set down key guidelines that might be important to, to define, such as whether or not the use of neuroscience and technology represents a, a less harmful option than other currently available forms of intervention for optimization or even for leveraging warfare and combativeness against others. Are things ex these acceptable under standard rules of conduct, just war and just conduct under war, or just conduct to prevent war, use contra bellum, for example, and a variety of others. And then ultimately, we have to expand that view to look at not only the idiosyncratic risks to individuals and groups of individuals, but ultimately systemic and existential risks that may exist beyond the proximate use. In other words, how will this change the world stage? Might this be a paradigm shift? And now you open that Pandora's box and you can't get those gremlins back in. So the process is multifold. I think it, it is not just discursive. It needs to be truly dialectical. There are going to be opposing views. I think an approach that takes a reflective equilibrium and then seeks to gain some level of, of synthesis is going to be important. But those are easy words to say and those actions are not necessarily easy to do. 
keeping these pieces that we've talked about so far in mind, if you could make one policy recommendation with respect to the development of neurocognitive tools in support of the DOD, what would that look like? There needs to be viable policy and support. And what, what I mean by this is, is not just the underlying policy that directs, but also policy that provides funding, support, and sustainability of continuity of research and continuity of care of those individuals if we're seeking to enable or optimize their performance and we're asking their consent. This has to be based upon our intellectual honesty of what we know and what we don't know. But if what we're asking individuals to do not only is to get in harm's way so as to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, what they're asking them to do is also to essentially be neuronauts, to go where no one has gone before so as to optimize their performance in key ways in those missional tasks, then the obligation and the policy necessary to uphold that obligation must in fact provide ongoing research specifically for those individuals as well as others, and certainly provide the, the mechanisms, support, resources, goods, and services for the continuity of care, both when they are in service and after their service is ended. Thank you, Dr. Giordano. I think that's it for questions on RN today. Thanks for sharing your expertise. It's always a joy to have you on with us. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to work with you, and thanks again. Thank you for joining the HD IAC podcast. To learn more about our other services, please reach out directly or visit us online at www.hdiac.org.